Thank you, Monica and LD, for the powerful insights and for unveiling the report. Let's now decode the report in its full essence. So moving on to our panel discussion, uh, I would like to call upon stage Monica Khurana, country head and... Sorry, my bad. Wrong. Wrong one. I'm going to do this again. Let's call upon stage our panelists first. Anushri Ghosh, General Manager and Head of Digital Marketing, Content, Data, Media and E-Commerce Growth, ITC Limited Foods Division, Gautam Surat, COO, Performix, Satya Raghavan, Director, Marketing Partners, Google, Siddhant Rana, Head of Partnerships, India, Shopify, and Pratik Mukherjee, Head of Business, Beauty, House of Masaba. Our moderator for this panel is Anshul Garg, Managing Partner and Head of Publicis Commerce India. A big round of applause to welcome our panelists. Can we get the chairs, three mics and everything set up please? Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, all the panelists, for joining us here, uh, taking out time and then coming here. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, when we started this report, uh, we thought about this D2C. Almost everyone understands what this is. But getting the value out of D2C has been a challenging task for a lot of brands. right? Hence, we thought of we'll start this uh, report and then give value uh, in terms of insights. Uh, and I'm so excited that we have all the right stakeholders because a huge ecosystem, we have different type of stakeholders here. And then at least you represent uh, the different uh, ecosystem partners in this. So thank you so much for joining in. Uh, we'll just write, uh, jump in the questions. So I'll start with you. Uh, so I know uh, you have been part of a lot of uh, big tech firms, including Google for the last 10 years and then uh, Microsoft. Uh, you have been with the uh, part uh, brands as well, Star, General uh, Mills, and you have had your own startup. So you've seen pretty much the kind of evolution of technology India has seen, the kind of uh, customer expectation we have seen uh, change over the period of time. So, in your opinion, how this evolving digital technology, as well as uh, I guess quarter by quarter, all the all the expectation of uh, customers are changing. How do you see this impact the D two C growth in India? Well, thanks, and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start off by saying that uh, you know thanks for the report, very insightful. I uh, I loved, uh, and this is for you, LD. I loved the slide on uh, page 38 of the report, where you talk about how a brand can move from the red to the black. I think it's really insightful, and the way you've put it there uh, makes it very meaningful, actually, and easy to understand. Um, so uh, I can uh, kind of answer your question uh, through my own journey in this space. Um, so when I joined Google in 2014, um, I was leading YouTube uh, the, you know, as a business in India. And I pretty much did that uh, for over eight years. And when I joined, there were 50 million uh, you know, consumers who would come to YouTube on a daily basis. Uh, and about two years ago, when I moved on to this new role, there were about 500 million people who would come on a daily basis. right? So uh, through that journey, I was able to intimately understand how digital technology and consumer behavior are actually so interlinked, right? Um, whatever content would go up on YouTube would be reflect would be a reflection of where Indian society was at that point of time. And Indian society would watch that content and get influenced. So uh, if I try and uh, draw back a parallel to your report, right, the pillars that you've 
put together of uh, trying to understand the consumers better, trying to innovate for them, trying to build a better product, fit into all of this in a different context, but it's exactly the same three pillars that uh, are very important. I cannot stress more on the importance of trying to understand the consumer better, whether you do it through uh, you know, A-B testing or uh, in, in our case, we had the famed algorithm which would do that for us on a you know, daily basis. Um, Google started using the power of AI pretty much below the hood, uh, unlike what we now see, which is where AI, you know, uh, my mother-in-law uses AI. <clears throat> so uh, we used it below the hood to really understand the consumer. And I think that really is the opportunity and challenge for D2C brands, which is how do you understand this consumer? Uh, and I, I think when we all look at India and the report hinted at it, right, we think of it as a very diverse and homogenous, uh, heterogeneous uh, base of consumers. But within that heterogeneity is the homogeneity that we have to seek uh, and try and understand the consumers better. Uh, and then obviously, like LD said, use, the, use uh, partners like Publicis uh, to hunt for lookalikes, uh, you know, increase reach, increase penetration and things like that. So I think uh, just one thing, the D2C journey for any brand should be anchored in the consumer is just the one thing that I'd like to leave behind. Super, thank you so much. My takeaway is uh, you need to understand the customer better and through data, nothing like it. Uh, Anushri, I'll probably come down to uh, you now. So you, uh, you have been uh, running the growth agenda for ITC store, which is a big D2C platform for ITC apart from your other roles in digital marketing as well as content marketing. And then uh, you have been on both sides of brand as well as agency. So my question to you is a two-part question. One, what is the key advantage uh, that you see a D2C channel offers for a traditional uh, brand like ITC? At the same time, what are the challenges that you see which hinder your scale? Because opening is one thing, uh, scaling is second. Over to you. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, I'm not going to say anything new, which has not already been said, to be honest. But I think one cardinal difference uh, that has emerged, and I think Sat Satya touched upon the scale of digital, and of course, you know, the report also kind of alluded to the scale of e-commerce as a behavior, so to speak. I think that's kind of really um, gained the hockey stick effect in, in ever since the pandemic happened and then the post-pandemic uh, era also kind of really gave a lot of impetus to commerce first, e-commerce first thinking. So I think what kind of really shifted for mass brands, uh, and, and I represent uh, a house of a lot of mass brands, some niche brands, and some D2C first businesses. So it's not just ITC store, there are several D2C first businesses as well. Like for example, there is a platform called Meri Chakki or Namma Chakki, which is actually in Bangalore. Meri Chakki is based out of uh, Delhi. Uh, and it essentially kind of mimics uh, the consumer behavior uh, of, you know, this. the enemy of package data essentially is Chakki Ata in, to some extent. Uh, you know, how do you really mimic the same consumer behavior through technology uh, is also a D2C model. There are a couple more. Uh, we have a luxury chocolate brand called Fabel. Uh, also has an FMCG portfolio, which also kind of has a D2C kind of a model. So I think all of it kind of converges into this new muscle, so to speak, of a mass, of, of an organization which actually talks to, uh, you know, has mass brands and talks to um, consumers at scale. Uh, is this piece ar around retention? You know, I mean, mass brands essentially know OTS, reach, frequency, and now the story has shifted to, you know, how do you count? Uh, for what you have really acquired? How do you really retain this consumer into meaningfully into an ecosystem which is owned, uh, you know, through experiences, through a value exchange, so to speak? Uh, you know, I mean, there are various ideas which are floating around, and, and I think you've touched upon it uh, in the report, uh, in the, uh, you know, summarization that LD put together as well, which essentially means that if, you know, if there is a brand experience which you need to kind of bring alive, and digital actually enables you to do that. And if you have a logical destination, which kind of really, you know, complements it through a consumer purchase, is what D2C is all about, right? Um, but yes, uh, in terms of the metrics to measure, and, and I think I probably fall in the last uh, piece where we are not really very clear about putting a profitability uh, metric yet to kind of chase uh, for a D2C, because I think it's, 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 it is there for the long haul. Um, it is essentially bringing alive the quadrant of media, data, 
uh, content and consumer insights, and of course, which kind of leads to product innovation and all of those good things, right? So um, I, I think to going back to the question that you asked in terms of how it helps, I think it kind of really um, enables uh, you to talk to consumers and really walk the talk. And you know, uh, and I think LD spoke about that gone are the days that you would build one film and really mount it. Uh, across different mediums, uh, you know, today brands have to really demonstrate the value exchange and any experience that you kind of put out there through technology, through uh, consumer interaction has to have a logical conclusion in the form of uh, purchase, which essentially gives you uh, a deeper consumer insight, which is really, really difficult to get through retailers, whether it's third party e-commerce retailers or modern trade or omni-channel, because that we are operate in a world of walled garden, so to speak. So we we rarely do get any visibility into market basket analysis or all of those good things which enable us to really tailor make our assortment or tailor make our communication or tailor make our media strategy to reach out, reach out to this consumer meaningfully. So yeah, to me, I think it's the quadrant of media, data, content, and consumer insights, which kind of really feeds Makes back sense into for the yes. Great, thank you so much, Anushri. Uh, with this, I'll go to you, uh, Gautam. I know you have been uh, almost 20 years with the group now, and then uh, you have seen uh, both India as well as China uh, so closely, so you understand the consumer uh, cohort that we're looking at very well. And then uh, probably I'll take uh, the discussion ahead uh, what Anushri was also uh, hinting at. So what do you think, since you've seen the multiple D2C brand journey evolve, what do you think, what kind of D2C strategy a brand should take to navigate towards path of profit, uh, profitability? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, so it's an interesting question. I think uh, one of the ways to kind of look at uh, the space of marketing in itself is, is I think of it as, as what we call as a, a complex adaptive system uh, in the sense that there are so many moving parts. Sometimes it's very difficult to identify what's working, what's not working. Uh, and, and I think through the report, that's exactly what we were trying to address because uh, sometimes there are competitor activities, there's, you know, uh, economic factors, so many things happening that if we just try and look at the data, it's very difficult to sort one from the other. What this report really called out for us and, and from a profitability standpoint is, is of course, the point that you mentioned around uh, consumer insights, but insights is a very, very broad word, right? Where do you bring it to bear uh, is, is, is the part. And I think most of the people we spoke to and the businesses we uh, work with found that if you bring it to bear largely on two or three specific areas, uh, you will start seeing uh, offshoots of that profitability. Uh, and, and those are around, you know, uh, the things that Anushri talked about is, is how can you build unique experiences, uh, whether it is product-led or it is consumer experience-led. Uh, but that there needs to be a reason for somebody to come uh, to your D2C, and that, that becomes one of the big, big critical factors. Uh, and, and I think even in the report, when, we, uh, when you go through it, you will find that the range of impact that people felt it will have on the business was one of the highest. And I think the, the thing that we kind of uh, don't delve into too much, but the operational ex excellence part. Uh, it's, it's also consumer insights into where will consumers wait for product to come, where will they not wait to understand some of those outcomes also from a consumer insight is critical to the way, you know, where you apply these insights and, and that's what will help in driving that process. Thank you so much, Gautam. Uh, now I'll go to you, Siddhant. Uh, so I know you have uh, worked with digital platforms like uh, Zomato, Snapdeal, Paytm, now Shopify. And in Shopify, in your current role, you've been partnering with all size of organizations, right? From the large organization uh, through to the small organization. And uh, with this uh, entire D2C uh, huge growth that is coming through, then how do you think uh, technology and digital tools that we have in the today's age would help us optimize or the brands optimize the operational efficiency or enhance customer engagement that we've been talking about through the report as well as right now in the discussion and finally uh, drive towards profitability but more on the lens of tech and digital tools yeah absolutely um, i think uh, you know i always say this whenever you're building a d2c brand right there's three broad areas um, that you want to look at one is technology one is operations and one is marketing right and you know, when you're picking a technology, uh, it's very important to go through the right evaluation, right? Like in terms of, uh, I mean, cost is definitely one that everybody will ask for, but I always look at it more from an ROI perspective, right? One is that bucket. Second is, is it a scalable, secure, 
platform that you have because you want to make sure that you give that experience to your consumers, right? Uh, the third most important thing generally is, uh, is it able to give you the right kind of support? Like if, you know, things go south, uh, there's, uh, you obviously want to make sure that it's a future forward platform because you can always invest into a platform a whole lot and create, you know, the first version of it. But if you see the rate at which technology is evolving, you want to be on a platform which, you know, gives you that edge. And at Shopify, we spend like more than a billion dollars in R&D every year, right? Just to make sure that our brands can continue to trust us with their business, right, in that sense. So these are some criteria that you, you know, you go through your evaluation, you pick a platform. You want to make sure your ops are fixed because that catalog should be live, right? If 80% of your catalog's live, then you're already losing out on 20% there, right? Uh, do you have next day delivery? These are all hygiene things that I think brands need to make sure that they delve into the depth of it to make sure that they're ready. And then marketing, we got some good insights, right? But once you get your customer on your site, you want to make sure you convert them, right? And yeah. that's where uh, there's a lot of things you can do uh, because you spent a bunch of money already on your marketing to acquire this customer. You want to make sure he stays there, he converts. So for that, you want to make sure that your search works really well. You dive into the, the depth of that to make sure that they're getting to see contextually what they came to search for. You want to make sure that uh, once they're on the product pages, they're able to get all the information about your products and the promise that you're making, right? That brand promise should be uh, very easy. You, you should make sure that you have an experience to maybe upsell, cross-sell. A lot of brands <laughs> actually create like very hygiene D2C experiences on their platform. Whereas the technology today actually enables you to do that. Uh, so are you giving the best checkout, the best payment methods? All of this combined creates that best ROI, right? Uh, and each of these things take you some time to go through and get it done. But it, today with the technology that's accessible, you can get it done really fast. And then once you have your customer, it doesn't end there, right? Like, are you retaining them, right? There's a 70% probability of retaining a customer versus a five to 10% on acquiring, right? So you want to make sure that you have a loyalty program. You want to make sure that uh, you are remarketing using all the tools out there, right? And not, not spamming, but remarketing and doing that value. So these are some of the things that I always urge D2C brands to like. Oh, thanks, Siddhant. My uh, takeaway would be that uh, you need to have the scalable platform with the right kind of uh, capabilities that you're looking at and then ensure you have a clear path of ROI defined on this. Absolutely. Because many times uh, total cost of ownership also goes very high and it becomes very difficult uh, for you to justify. Uh, and with this, I'll go to you, Prateek. Uh, so I know you have uh, been on both sides of the spectrum. You have been working with big brands as well as uh, digital age brands, new digital first brands, uh, PNG, Mama, the now House of Masaba. And you've also worked on platforms which are urban company in product market, which are very new age. So I guess you would be uh, best place to answer this question. Uh, so how do you think a brand should differentiate themselves in a crowded market of D2C? Now this is growing really, really well. A lot of new brands are coming almost every month, right? So how do you differentiate yourself? And then how do you ensure that consistent uh, brand messaging is going through all the channels that you have. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to just start by giving kudos to MMA publicists and all of you for doing this. Uh, I would say category building for D2C, even though D2C has been around uh, for a fairly long time. Uh, having been on so many sites, I can tell you that even now there is a lot of education that needs to happen. Uh, there are people who still feel that if you are doing D2C, you are walking on a path of no return. So so congratulations to everybody involved in uh, uh, this entire thing. Uh, it's also great to share platform with partners without whom we would not have been here. I just realized, Siddhant, the number of times I've called you last year <laughs> regarding payments and converting Shopify to a plus account. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite good to see the entire uh, community come together like this. Uh, coming to a question, uh, uh, while your report already talks about a few aspects, I can share a few best practices that have worked for me in my uh, past few uh, experiences. Uh, in my previous organization, for example, first and foremost, we would not launch a brand till not just the brand proposition, but the brand purpose is locked and tested. Even a young brand 
uh, I, I know Mama Earth is already part of the report and uh, you have talked about the whole goodness inside proposition. Uh, for others in the room, there are not just one, but it's a house of brands. And uh, we, over a period of time, created a sort of playbook that before you launch a brand, uh, good old concept testing, uh, you know, which uh, every marketer in this room must be aware of, we would do that rigorously, uh, and only then go live with our, uh, you know, D2C website. That sort of safeguards you before even you have launched or at a pre-product market fit stage. Second, uh, the brand manager or the business head would run the CX personally for the first quarter. I would also take 100 plus calls of customers in the first quarter. We would not give it to any third party or any CX team because you get a gold mine of insights in those first few months. Product feedback, packaging feedback. We have recalled products, changed formulation, relaunched it. Uh, one D2C allows you to do that, but uh, the question is, are we? How many of us are really doing that? So for us, uh, it was a gold standard that we must do CX ourselves. That will already tell you if you are, if you are so-called theoretical proposition is cutting it with the early adopters or not. So, so that was second. Uh, thirdly, we would also very quickly create a community of brand friends who would not just be. Uh, promoting our brand, uh, so not to be confused uh, as influencers, but also brand evangelists. They would feedback into the product or what should be launched next, uh, what should be discontinued immediately, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we would call them to office, do focus groups, understand the initial response, and then gradually scale it up. So even before you hit the treadmill, you are already safeguarded on various fronts at a pre-launch pre stage. And uh, the fear of crowded space uh, keeps all of us, including me, awake at night. Uh, I belong to the beauty and personal care industry, and uh, I think the numbers LD put up uh, speaks for itself. Every month, there are new brands which are entering, uh, with the barrier to entry being very low. Uh, to make matters worse, even product differentiation isn't that big a deal with third-party manufacturers available across the world and accessible as well. Uh, I think in the last decade, a lot of brands have scaled up purely behind certain products. Uh, so for me, uh, business is a triangle of product, channel, and brand. A lot of brands which have scaled up purely behind a few products and one channel, they stand at a huge risk of being replaced. The ones who have got the third axis of brand and proposition and purpose right, are the ones who will probably make the cut. Uh, the brands with the highest uh, unaided brand awareness are still the older brands, by the way, uh, and not the ones in the last four or five years. They still have a journey to make. Even when I look at your report, uh, a lot of the success stories are pre-COVID launches. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, brands are taking different routes, going omni much before, and so on and so forth. So I would leave it open to say that everyone in this room and outside have a job to do to crack the next brand proposition uh, and successfully scale it up uh, in whichever category they are operating in. Got it. So I understand. And then I believe the big takeaway for me would be uh, how do you ensure that you do the right test and learn to lock the value proposition? Uh, because that would define your future course. And as well as how do you ensure that uh, uh, you define your uh, panel really, really well, the community, so that you get early on feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, Satya, I'll come back to you uh, with this. So while we talked about the, uh, a lot of uh, D2C brands uh, now building direct connection um, uh, with the uh, consumers, so since you work with such a huge spectrum of brands, how do you see uh, both uh, smaller brands uh, through to the big traditional brands. How are they seeing D2C in future, let's say five years from now, how this would unfold according to you? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd still like to anchor this in the consumer space, right? Um, uh, one of the things we are seeing is brands are, are able to understand consumers a lot better than they possibly did ever before. Um, and, and the reason this is the case is that it's actually uh, a need earlier uh, we were very homogenous. So uh, when I was possibly 10 years old, my parents bought me nothing. But whatever they bought, every marketer or brand would market to them. 
today it's a little more complicated than that, than that. Um, it's important to not just understand the hows like how Siddhan talked about on a particular website or a platform but it's also important to understand one who's buying what are they buying and who are they buying it for so it's it's even more complicated in that sense is it in the um spectrum of personalization, you may to say, or yeah. is it more about defining the cohort really well? All of that, right? Uh, so, so for example, uh, I'm buying things for my 10-year-old, but what maybe a D2C brand does not understand is that my 10-year-old is actually carting it first. Correct. I'm possibly coming and, uh, you know, maybe just Take pressing the payment, the payment and all of that. So how do you then market your product? Who do you market to? How do you market it? How do you personalize your communications? Uh, Given we are entering the era of privacy now, uh, a lot of people actually won't like it if you market to, uh, you know, a particular age group and, and all of that. Uh, it's important to protect them from many things. So uh, a lot of these nuances are, I think, what successful D2C brands uh, will, you know, will really spend a lot of time on. Um, and I was kind of reflecting back on one of the slides which talked about uh, 600 to 700 uh, that Monica put up, 600 to 700 brands, I think that number is going to exponentially grow. Why? Because there are newer product categories. We are buying things for our dogs at this point correct, of time. right? Correct. We talked about a pet brand somewhere correct, uh, correct. earlier in the evening. So I just think the number of categories is going is, uh, is to increase. So there's going to be that much more attention for mind space, that much more attention uh, to how to scale uh, and, and all of that. right? So it's going to become even more complicated. Exactly as uh, I, I think uh, you put it, uh, you know, this is category building. Uh, we are early days yet. It's going to get even more complicated. Uh, but understanding how to understand your, or rather, understanding your consumer better, then figuring out ways to scale it using first party data, AI, and all of that, then become very critical. Uh, so brands which understand this and do it well, along with partners like Publicis, with branded content integration, along with partners, are the ones who will succeed. Thank you so much, Satya. Uh, with this, I'll come back to you, Anushree. Uh, so how do you think, uh, since you come from uh, ITC being primarily a manufacturing firm, if I were to say, uh, then how do you uh, see uh, traditional brands, uh, how do they ensure that they stand out compared to the D2C competitors that you have uh, in the product offering, pricing, as well as uh, brand messaging? So I think uh, I'm just going to kind of add to what... Uh, um, you know, to be honest, um, the D2C essentially, and D2C essentially means that you're reaching out to consumers directly and, and with the proposition which is a little, which is augmenting what you have already kind of really told the story about. So like the example that I was giving you, for example, you are selling a set of staple brands for years, but then the proposition has now shifted to custom mass customization, for example. Um, like the example of Mary Chakki that I gave you, or you know, make your own gift basket, for example, using a brand called Fidel, or, or create your own cookie, even creating newer occasions of consumption. So I think propositions and newer habit creation, or even probably the how-to piece in terms of how do you really create a category or even establish usage, ex existing usage or newer ways of using the product, they are all essentially kind of then getting encapsulated in the way you kind of craft the proposition, which then informs your, the technology that you're going to use, the CX that you're going to come up with, how do you, you know, you keep creating and correcting it over a period of time. And I think uh, somewhere you spoke about how, how the brand owner essentially is the user of CX and then optimizing it for the consumer. I think those are really things that mass brands have never really tasted uh, or re really even Correct. thought about, you know, it's, like I said, it was all about creating one piece of communication, putting it out there in a one-to-many kind of a ecosystem to moment of truth becoming, uh, becoming really close to, com uh, close for comfort, to be honest, you know, because you exactly know what's working and what's not. And the other piece is D2C essentially for uh, the entire e-commerce ecosystem, um, for large brands, it is very complementary. You know, what you learn on D2C, if you really, really learn it well, you can actually apply it uh, on your third-party, uh, you know, e-commerce strategies. Um, your D2C essentially becomes the haven for your long tail and your 
niches that you want to grow, which becomes a really expensive proposition from a discovery perspective on, say, um, a marketplace or a quick commerce and so on and so forth. So I think the use cases are many, and there are you know newer use cases which are emerging as the consumer becomes more mature. To me, I think D2C is a muscle or uh, or a capability that actually probably defines the digital maturity of an organization. So hence, it's really long term rather than just looking at it as a channel um, and comparing it with, uh, say, a third party uh, e-commerce e channel and then trying to kind of really you know solve towards profitability and revenue, so to speak. So I think it's slightly early days. I think you test and you learn and then you kind of go. Uh, but yes, uh, it is here to stay. It is for the long haul. It is for a larger organizational strategy rather than just a channel strategy, which is fly by night and which is going to seize because it's not really driving profitability. So, uh, I, I, I completely agree that this will going to go, uh, coexist for a very long time and then probably traditional brands uh, would need to learn some things from digital first brand. How do you start a digital journey? Correct. What's happening now is, you know, you're coming up with brands while, like I said, very high penetration brands have existed, but the newer models are actually digital first because the consumer is digital first. And hence, D2C becomes a logical, uh, you know, uh, augmentation strategy to, to your marketing, you know, mix. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll come back to you, Gautam. So now again, uh, probably uh, take your agency lens and then how do you think... Uh, what is the main difference in applying your D2C strategy when you talk about traditional brands moving towards online versus uh, uh, people like, let's say, Mama Earth, which, which are digital first from day one? And again, they are also going offline. But how do you think, how do you differentiate in D2C strategy? Right. I think, uh, I think uh, primarily there are two different learning journeys. Uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, traditional brands, as we call them, have very, very strong muscle memory when it comes to building things like mental availability, right? They, they, people know these brands, they're well aware of the brands. Uh, there is already a latent amount of demand that's been created. And so when you start, when you start, you're already at, at you're not at zero. You're, you, you've already got a base of consumers also and, and some understanding of how to grow that. What you're learning there is more bringing the technology side in, right? Versus a digital first brand, which has to go the whole journey at one go. You can't afford to say, let me set up tech and then I'll build mental availability. It has to go at one go and your learning is heavily driven there on building the mental availability side of it. So the end outcome is probably you're looking for the same goal, but the journeys are very, very different uh, and, and come with different, different capabilities for each of these. Great. Thank you so much. With this, I'll uh, come back to you, Siddhant. So how do you think what Factors distinguish successful D2C ventures from their uh, counterparts, which are probably not being able to do so. And how do you do? Yeah, so I, I really like what Pratik said, like, so the brand story and all that, right? But uh, just from a technology perspective, right? Some of the things that we are seeing brands do uh, that will help them win in this space, right? Is their ability to sort of navigate in this multi-channel world, right? I think... Um, Depending on the brand, channels can vary, right? But you want to be available on all those channels wherever your consumer is. If you want to be a 100 crore plus brand in India today, you cannot just do it through your own online store and we recognize that, right? So we help brands to use our systems to also sell across channels, right? And a lot of our plus merchants are doing that uh, where they're selling on, uh, whether it's a, you know, a rare rabbit who's fulfilling from their store, whether it's a Sony who's fulfilling out of their you know, Sony centers and creating those omni-channel uh, journeys, uh, whether it's a Prashanti Saris who uses YouTube, uh, Satya, like you mentioned, to do daily uh, video drops, right, and drive sales on her Shopify store, right, all the way to, uh, you know, somebody who is now exploring even B2B e-commerce, right, a D2C brand who gets a lot of, you know, inputs from uh, SMBs who want to resell the product. So you need to be everywhere and use technology wisely there. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's a few more things I could cover, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you so much. I'll just quickly uh, come back to you, uh, Prateek. So just one question for you. How do you think uh, with uh, the exponential growth that we are seeing in D2C brand, how the future of retail would look like? I think uh, if I manifest the future, 
the brands which will survive will all be omni-channel. And we will be having omni-channel conferences like the one we are having now for D2C. Uh, as uh, you already mentioned, brands always start from a position of strength. So uh, ITC, PNG, Unilever, they have last mile distribution, distributors across the world, across the country and the world rather. They would always start with uh, launching their brands in those channels, which is proven for them. And then simultaneously build their online muscle, like you guys are doing at ITC. Even my other colleagues in HULPNG do the same. For a Mama Earth or for some of the D2C first brands, the journey has been reversed. But today, while I am not supposed to give out the revenue numbers, uh, you will be surprised that it's uh, pretty even online, offline. And uh, that's why I said, I see a future of coexistence of all channels, as Sidhan said. This is the target that the brand is chasing. For a, for a house of Masaba, for example, we went omni-channel quickly. We were able to leverage some of the offline strengths of the Aditya Birla group, which we are part of, to get a foot in the door. Otherwise, for a young brand, it would have been very hard to get into those locations. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's just the path is different, but every brand is uh, getting into a omni-play sooner or later. Thank Great. you. Uh, thanks, Priti. With this, I'll just quickly summarize my thoughts on this. So I guess three things. One is uh, consumer learning is very important. Uh, second, uh, this is going to be a uh, long haul. So you need to be probably thinking more like an uh, omni-channel. And third, uh, we need to harness data to ensure we have first-party data as well uh, to create our cohorts as well as offerings. With this, do we have uh, time for Q&A? <laughs> okay, cool. We'll do that later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you so much. Please stay back for a token of appreciation. Can we have the bags, please? And I'm so sorry, you will catch them later at you know networking and cocktails and ask all the questions you want. <laughs> so when you're thinking about D2C, AOV is a very important factor, right? Um, given the current thresholds of GDPs of most people in the country, uh, what in your experience for a successful D2C guys to build a profitable business is a good AOV? Uh, it's a very uh, subjective question to the category large, yeah, and the brand you're playing. There is a cost today on Meta uh, and other platforms. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's uh, the CAC? What's the AOV sweet spot? For me, the guard guiding principle has been uh, to keep the CAC equal to AOV. Uh, as much as possible in the first first two years of the brand's journey as you are acquiring more people. Uh, like I said, it's very subjective depending on the category that you play in. What's the average? Uh, how is your brand positioned? Is it a mass brand, mass premium brand? How is your pricing? I'm assuming you're looking at a mass premium plus plus brand. Uh, the answer is in my mind, CAC initially should be not too high, but it has to be less than or equal to AOV. AOV is where I put a cap when it comes to, let's say, scaling a campaign up or down. But for me, more than AOV, the guiding principle has been ROAS, if I'm, being, if I'm just opening your question up a little more. Uh, and I've seen worlds where brands are okay to operate at a less than one ROAS in the first couple of years. I've seen the other extreme of four ROAS, where you have existing awareness, so you just funnel the Google search. And uh, I am right now somewhere in the middle. So I think it's also important to be disciplined with ROAS. It's at the end of the day AIML. So you train the system in a way that it will stay within the ROAS guardrail defined by your management, basis the PNL, other costs which are covered in the report beautifully. So, so for me, it's always a ROAS guardrail that dictates my actions uh, versus chasing other metrics. Basically, you know, ROAS over AOV. Yeah. yeah. Anushree, I want to check with you this thing that uh, in general, you know, whatever, when we speak to a lot of D2C guys, uh, we probably find that businesses which are success or, or the kind of products they sell, if their AOV is north of 1200 rupees, you know, for businesses which you sell less than 700, 800, uh, if their average order value is 700, 800, they really struggle. Yes. Yeah. Right. And businesses which are north of 1200, uh, they are able to get to the profitability path much faster. You are right. Uh, but then again, I, I think I would uh, agree with uh, what. Karthik was saying. So I think it's it's actually what the category that you are in uh, and also depends on the portfolio uh, of 
uh, B2C actually focuses on a, a, a slightly differentiated portfolio, and that's that's the beauty of it, right? If I if I were to compete with uh, other channels uh, where my KVIs are already selling because there is mental availability, uh, if I use if I replicate the same on my D2C, I think the purpose is getting defeated. So I think high, slightly higher contribution, higher margin products, which essentially will then have a slightly higher um, ASP. Um, and hence, uh, this number of consumer acquisition and AOV kind of costs and AOV kind of really speaking to each other for the first couple of years does make sense. Um, and that's what you should kind of gun for. But I think in case of habit building products, because there is a repeat value to, because I represent an organization where there is repeat value, there's frequency of purchase, uh, then I think a monthly AOV also starts to kind of make uh, a lot of sense. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, a basket size, for example, of a family of four, we have traditionally learned that it's somewhere around 1500 uh, with, you know, you have Atta spices, a little bit of personal care products and so on and so forth. It should be close to around that same pri that same range that you have learned even from an offline retail perspective, which is around 1500 1600 so I think that's what one should gun for and how you manage to do it, whether it's through, you know, upsell, cross-sell, uh, whether it's through some form of, uh, you know, recommendation engine which tries to kind of really push you to predictively, you know, suggest products. All of those are mechanisms which is a function of the tech product and the way you kind of use media. So, yes, I would suggest it's, it's somewhere close to what you have already learned uh, through your uh, offline business. Thank you. I'm so sorry. We can Thank take you. as many so questions. Fine. Yes, yes, yes. I have to be the villain here. I have no choice. Okay, so thank you, panelists. Can we just call Anupriya up on stage again, please, to give away a token of thanks to our panelists? Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you. Picture, please. Yes. All right. Okay, so a quick shout out again for those who weren't in the room. The QR code will be flashed on the screen and it's actually there on both sides of the screen in case you want to scan it. It's a combined QR code, so you can download the report, follow us on social media, and also give us your valuable feedback so we can constantly up our game for you.